Now we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And we're talking today at the four o'clock block about transitional justice with uh, Moises Montiel. Uh, he joins us from Mexico City. He teaches in a university there, and he's also a uh, practicing lawyer there in Mexico City. Welcome to the show, Moises. Jay, thank you so much for having me. I'm super thrilled to be here. We're super thrilled to have you. The topic of the show today is crowdsourcing accountability and transitional uh, justice. And you and I agreed that there was really more than one interpretation appropriate to the term crowdsourcing, but let's take yours first. What do you mean by crowdsourcing? Sure. Uh, what, I was trying to be clever, but maybe did not succeed that much at it. You know, having other people help you or, or keep tabs, if you will. You know, when we're talking about transitional justice, there's a huge component there about truth and accountability. Okay, so what, what I wanted to explore today was the role that could be played by, you know, the international community as expressed in international organizations, mostly, you know, UN human rights apparatus in keeping track of, you know, mass and gross violations of human rights. Well, and yeah, and what you said before the show touched me, namely is to try to get the word out so that people other than you are taking action in the matter. So tell us, tell us in the context of human rights and having and having people, um, you know, do the work and take action uh, in a crowdsourcing methodology. How does that work? How do you how do you start it and how do you make it happen? Right. So as you know, Jay, um, mostly when you have this gross and systematic patterns of violations of human rights at the domestic level, there's usually a lot of, of uh, opacity. You know, there, there's lack of access to information and there's also difficulties in getting the information out on, you know, uh, basically what's happening inside the country. I'm Venezuelan, okay? And, and uh, let me just explain this real quick with an example. Last week on the 25th, memory serves well, Venezuela sat the universal periodic review. So this is kind of a peer-to-peer -peer assessment that is conducted every four years between the states at the Human Rights Council at the United Nations. Okay, so while it may not be as effective as other tools in the international repertoire in, you know, signaling responsibility and pointing the finger at, you know, the, the grossest abusers of human rights, it does help keep track of the human rights performance and record of states. And that, you know, you got some recommendations four, year, four years ago, and now you have to sit the review again and have your record scrutinized. Of course, there, there's always a dimension of politics here, and I'll be super quick about this. Uh, some, for example, the, the coordinators of Venezuela's review were Belarus, Somalia and Cuba. Okay, well, that's so a motley exactly, crew. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, not exactly the you know the, the the perfect record on the board, but then you know uh, it was a uh, well, it, it was a significant number of countries that chipped in in the discussion. They they formulated suggestions to Venezuela, which actually, in a very subtle way, draw attention to you know the the horrific, the ter terrible, sorry. Uh, record that the country has. And, and I think there's a lot of value here when you look at it from the perspective of transitional justice. Yeah. Okay, so you have a review and you are, the, Venezuela, I guess, as a country is reviewed um, by this, this panel, so to speak, and, and the panel makes a determination that, let's say, there are problems. Oh. Um, do they name names? Um, they usually don't. This very particular mechanism of the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, it's more of a let's try not to trash talk each other too much. Just point the finger on where the problems are. Of course, this is by far not the only human rights mechanism at the United Nations. It's just one of the most visible ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, then you have some other mechanisms which are far more inquisitive, even adversarial, okay, in that, you know, individuals can bring complaints against states for actual and specific violations of their human rights. Say, you know, the Committee on Human Rights, the Committee on, Polit on Social and Economic Rights, you know, the, there's a myriad of them. But 
coming back to the point, the thing is, for example, the UPR produces a report with the, the compendium of the recommendations issued by the countries. So then when Venezuela sits again, the review in four years, they, they will elaborate the report on the basis of those recommendations that were approved. So it's kind of a, a, an institutional blog of you know, the, the human rights situation as perceived by other countries. So uh, why would a given country be reviewed? Why was Venezuela reviewed? Well, is every country in the world reviewed? Uh, technically, every member of the United Nations should at some point set this review. And normally they do this in four year cycles. You know, most states go easy on the reviewee. Okay, in that, you know, you don't want to cause political friction. But then again, for example, in a context such as Venezuela, in which everything is polarized, you know, it's a, it's little more than a popularity contest, but it does put, it does put the finger on you know the, the main patterns of human rights violations on the country. Of course, the the country who's sitting the review also gets a say. They get to justify themselves. In the case of Venezuela, it was this rhetoric about you know the U.S. sanctions and you know poor me, I can't do anything. If you allow me a very brief comment here, I've never seen uh, a sanctioned a sanction, sorry, torture or forcibly disappear anyone. So I'm not really sure how that logic operates here. But the important part with the UPR and, you know, this plethora of mechanisms at the United Nations human rights system is that at least there's a record you know, of, of violations of, you know, the, the investigations that go into each of these allegations, be it from civil society, be it from the United Nations body themselves, be it from the victims, you know, there's a record there. And I think that's very important towards a, a later point, be it at the national level or, you know, the International Criminal Court, if, if that is the case, you know, they have a, an abundance of information there that will definitely need to be taken into account. Into account for what? In other words, suppose uh, these three countries go down there through their staffers, you know, I suppose you and I could be staffers. We could be investigators. We could look around and, and smell and smell it, whatever it is. We could talk to people who uh, claim to be victimized. Uh, we could write it up and put it, put it all in this compendium. And we take it back to uh, New York, I suppose. <clears throat> and we say, this is really a terrible country. Um, these guys are you know, violating human rights left and right. Um, so why don't you guys do sanctions? But could we say that? Would we say that? Have they said that? And what kind of sanctions? I, um, well, actually, the, the Human Rights Committee itself is not a, able to levy sanctions. At worst, you know, a, a very forceful condemnation. Uh, and, that, you know, that's actually not very common. However, in other, I mean, in different parts of the human rights system at the UN, for example, you could actually declare the international responsibility of the state. Of course, that's not going to produce per se sanctions. But then, for example, when you take it to the context of you know the, the formal investigation that's taking place at the criminal international criminal court on you know officers of, of the Venezuelan government, well, that's actually part of, of, of the body of the investigation that should be taken into account by the prosecutor's office. Is it evidence? It could. Theoretically, count as evidence. There, there are some. I mean, there are some minor caveats here. Um, you know, there are some very specific and stringent requirements for any kind of information to to become evidence. For example, at the International Criminal Court. But who's to say that the rigor and and you know the the methodology employed is not necessarily incompatible at human rights review mechanisms, and eventually before the International Criminal Court. And there's also another dimension here. Those reports, those investigations, those uh, claims brought against Venezuela in, in the different parts of the human rights mechanisms could also possibly become evidence at the local level. Say, if there were any real intention of, you know, looking into these allegations and, and you know, trying to, to punish those responsible for them, pause for laughter, um, well, then you have, you have, I mean, the, 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 
the king, the, how do you call that? The butcher's cut, as far as, you know, evidence goes. Yeah, the, like the Joker. Exactly, but yeah. my, my point here and what I keep coming back to is that while these mechanisms, more often than not, will not produce any tangible consequences in, in terms of sanctions, in terms of some form of punishment, they do serve as an institutional repository of valuable and vital information about the human rights behavior of the government. So make, is it made public to the world? It is, it is. Uh, not in all cases and not in all mechanisms, but it, it mostly is. You know, uh, as you may know, human rights deals a lot. I mean, the, the, the whole core of human rights, traf uh, they, they, their currency, so to speak, is naming and shaming. Okay, so you're trying to shame violator, violators into good behavior. Because, you know, countries care for, the, for their reputation. They, they invest a lot of resources, time and effort into keeping a good reputation. Okay, so that there is something that actually mm, invites them or persuades them into trying to show, you know, a nice facade uh, at the international community. Well, suppose I'm a, hmm, suppose I'm a, a government in another state, or I'm an investor, or I'm a major company thinking about, um, you know, uh, setting up shop in Venezuela, and I see this. I mean, do you expect, for example, that I would be discouraged from investing, discouraged from setting up shop, discouraged from making a deal? involving the Venezuelan government. Is that, is that what this is about? Absolutely, Jay. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the record, and I mean, it's not only torture, forced disappearances, extrajudicial executions, it's also, you know, take it, for example, proper property rights. There is no guarantee whatsoever that the government will not expropriate you. And, and that's also human rights. And, you know, if I'm a multinational, I'm Nike, I'm Starbucks, what have you, and I'm thinking about setting up shop in Venezuela, and I look at what's going on in there, you know, I would be severely discouraged. And also, and then there's another interesting linkage, I had not thought about it, but, you know, in terms of the reputation, now there's, there's this whole wave, uh, or I don't know if it's really new, but we're calling it business and human rights. When, you know, you, you are trying to get uh, corporations, businesses to, to help, to contribute towards the respect of human rights. So you have to conduct your human rights due diligence and, you know, to, to look whether the country allows for the respect and the protection of these rights. And as a company, I would be extremely discouraged to set up shop in a country like, say, Venezuela, Belarus, Somalia, Cuba, by looking at the records. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's also a practical matter, not having your employees disappear on you. Yeah, you know, uh, that's kind of bad for payroll. Yeah. Uh, you know, I tell you, uh, my sense of it is that this kind of violation of human rights is happening in many countries, um, many of whom are members of the United Nations, many of whom, as you suggest, are actually on these teams, these, these uh, review teams, that go out there and, they, and their hands are not clean. Um, they're going to come back with, um, you know, a, a compromised report. Uh, and everybody in the United Nations knows about it. You know, I, I wish, and I was around, I was very young, but I was around when, when they, they formed up the United Nations. When I was a school kid, we went down for tours of the United Nations building. And I thought the world of it, I thought we we're going to save everybody. But it hasn't worked out that way. And I mean, ideally, my, my view is the United Nations should have enough power. It doesn't, but it should have enough power to actually stop this stuff. Um, isn't, isn't that what, you know, isn't that what we aspire to? Uh, and why can't we get there? You know, I'm, 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 now that you bring this up, there's actually a couple thoughts I have on that. And, and I, I act, I'm actually left with a soundbite from what I think was your last interview with uh, Santiago Vargas Niño, who is a dear friend. Um, you know, the UN will only be as good or as efficient or as powerful as states allow it to be. There's actually this very heartbreaking phrase by a former secretary general of the UN, Dag Hammarskjöld, 
he said something to the effect of, you know, the United Nations was not created to take humanity to heaven, but to save it from hell. <laughs> Which I think it, it's a little bit cynical, but like all cynical things, it ultimately rings true. What, what I mean by this is that, and, and you know, I saw the, the U, Venezuela's UPR last week, and there was a lot of criticism going around the whole exercise because, you know, why would you be legitimizing a tyrannical regime by treating it as a peer? Okay, and, and shouldn't the UN have a more active hand, uh, you know, in, in trying to address the situations? Yeah, m maybe it should as a matter of ethics, but it is prevented and precluded from doing so by the very institutional design that it was created with. Okay, so, so and, and Santiago, last, I think it was last week, said something to the effect of, you know, these, the United Nations, even if it has a will of its own, it's no more, or among other things, a tool of the states, be it to legitimize despotic regimes or to try and bring about some positive change. I mean, we, we normally see the, the pitfalls and the shortcomings of the United Nations human rights system because, you know, it's very visible, it's very evident. But then normally the successes pass under the table. I mean, there, there, I, I cannot recall too many instances of success, but there have been some, mostly and ironically by engaging with states, trying to cajole them into respect for human rights. And I think that's a, a very positive role even in the case of the UPR, which actually seems like, you know, a hangout between bros and, you know, to talk about how good we are, but, you know, there's some room for improvement. But as long as you try not to isolate states too much, maybe, just maybe, you can get them, you know, to make good on some of their commitments, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. but, you know, but at the same time, Moises, um, it seems to me that and a part of it is, 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 is a result of my discussions with the people from Transitional Justice and Project Expedite Justice and so, um, is that, is that the, the amount, the volume of atrocities and war crimes in, in the world today is increasing. And, um, you know, we can talk about why, maybe it's, you know, it's regional or national, maybe it's, you know, it's sort of a whole degradation of morality around the world, but it is increasing, um, which, um, you know, I mean, if, if it in fact is increasing, you would want the countervailing action to be increasing also, because otherwise the formula takes you where you really don't want to go. M more atrocities and less enforcement. That's a problem. Um, you know, and, and that's why I, I think it's worthy at this point that we pivot to my interpretation of your title, okay? <laughs> Crowdsourcing, it, it evokes the notion of technology. It evokes the notion of, um, you know, keeping records, of, of having um, records available on the internet, on websites, to everyone in the world, and uh, using that methodology, you know, to, uh, to shame uh, bad actors, um, and more. And so when I thought, when I, saw, when I saw your title, I said, gee whiz, you know, like me, you know, Moises is, in, is into data. It's all about data. Let's say myself, you know, even if the United Nations doesn't actually do what we want them to do, we hope them to do, the fact is there's technology out there, even held by, by very, um, very hard hard countries like China, for example, um, but used effectively, um, where you have, it's, it's violation of privacy and all kinds of human rights, but they have a record. If, if you violate their norms, whatever their norms may be, um, you're gonna get it. They're, they're going to apply sanctions against you. And it works, for them it works uh, according to their norms, uh, although, surveillance is uh, very creepy and, and, and so the way they handle people, worse than creepy. Um, at the same time, there are countries like, uh, I think it was Washington Post yesterday had this really disturbing article about the war crimes going on in Kazakhstan. 
um, and really ugly things happening about disappearances and murders and torture, all this. I mean, you wouldn't have thought, but there it is, Kazakhstan, a mild mannered protest involving the, the price of oil, you know, for your car turns into a murderous episode where the police are really killing people by the car load out of nowhere. And you say to yourself, gee, that's awful. It's, it's an example, again, of the increase in atrocities and violations of human rights. So what I'm, what I'm thinking is that if there were, I'm really interested in your thought about this, if there were a database, call it atrocities.com, okay? And the results in Venezuela, by name, are reported by official, are reported around the world. And I know that this fellow, Joe Smith, I know that he has been guilty of atrocities. I know it's been reported and complained about him. Um, and it's more than the country. It's the shaming of the individual people who are involved and it's permanent and they will never escape from it. Their names will always be associated with the atrocities. Um, now, I don't know how, you know, that's pretty granular. I don't know how deep you can dig to actually get that information, but some of it anyway would be out there. Is there is there any good reason we could not do this? Okay, I, first first and foremost, I, and, and I'm a lawyer here, and, and you know we, you know we're we're kind of uh, how do you call that? You only see you have tunnel vision. Okay, so the first qualm I would raise with that is you know what about every you know everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, what about defamation? No, of course, of course. But and and then, but I would link that, for example, and and I think it comes down to transparency and and even the the easy the 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 ease with which information can now be disseminated. Say you had something like that, some sort of watchdog, and and we have a lot of NGOs, you know, fighting the good fight in order to to make visible things happening all around the world okay and now you have citizen journalists and and this is great but then we need to liaise that in some way with institutions that can actually then for example submit this kind of mischievous persons to the law and and now that you think now that you mention it jay uh i think it was last week or the week before you know that that we we've been having some some universal jurisdiction decisions coming out. I think it was Germany or something with a Syrian. Yes, uh, right. Yeah, that was, that was big news two weeks ago. Yes, and they convicted yeah. him and sentenced him. Exactly. So may, maybe I'm not a big fan of universal jurisdiction, mostly for political, not legal reasons. But you know, it is a tool and the toolkit. What if we bring together, you know, the, this increase in technology in both quantity and quality of technology and an actual attempt at crowdsourcing and democratizing you know the the let's call it the the monitoring of atrocities what if we were able to bring that with this new instances of say for example universal jurisdiction so you know that the world will eventually become a lot smaller for people who are grossly abusing human rights. And I think it all comes back to the point I was trying to raise with the original title. I'm sorry for the misrepresentation, but well, I, that's okay. I we can have different interpretations. Well. <laughs> no, and I think they work very well together. I mean, we have institutional memory in that, you know, the, this international organizations are keeping track or keeping a file on your human rights behavior, but you also have, an, a, you know, new ways in which citizens, you know, people, are able to document these atrocities, are able to disseminate the information, and ultimately having them serve as the basis to bring these people to justice at the local level, at the international level, or hell, I'll even concede, using universal jurisdiction, why not? Yeah, well, let's talk about that for a minute. Let me give you my thought about, you know, the, the Germans uh, probably had a lot of information about this Syrian defendant. Um, where did they get it? Well, they got it from NGOs that were collecting information on him. They got it from people who you know, made reports through the NGOs and presented themselves as, as witnesses. Um, it's all good that you know this could be 
public. Um, and I, I certainly, I, I grant you that, um, you know, I had to be careful about defamation. And aside from, you know, the legal aspect, you have to be careful about, about you know, uh, uh, retribution. You know, you put your name up as a complaining person, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you may, you may find yourself disappeared in a third, a third country. Who knows yep. what, you know, um, because you might be a witness and that, that you're revealing yourself and exposing yourself. So this has to be done carefully. Um, in any event, so the Germans found enough information to feel that they could prosecute under universal jurisdiction, and they did. And in, in a way, in the media anyway, it set a precedent. The whole world knew what was going on. And frankly, I think the whole world was waiting for one of those guys in Syria to be tried and convicted. So good for Germany. Germany can function even, even without Angela Merkel. <laughs> you can quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're all sad to see her go. But yes, I mean, while there are some, some small legal and political issues uh, surrounding universal jurisdiction, you know, you know, the global village, this whole thing about globalization, and, and I think it's actually positive, at least in ethical terms, that international law and international criminal law are, you know, they're riding the wave and, and they're becoming borderless, if you will, okay, not so constrained by domestic borders. My issues with universal jurisdiction <clears throat> is that, you know, it's the same, the same thoughts I have, for example, about the Nuremberg or Tokyo trials back in, in the 40s. You know, were they necessary from an ethical standpoint? Yes, absolutely. You had to punish those atrocities, and at some point you had to set a precedent. Were they legal? Oof. Now, that's a big question, and I'm not entirely convinced they were. However, as you know full well, uh, law takes the back seat in the face of politics, sometimes for good, sometimes not for such noble ends. But, you know, hey, it's, part, it's a function of the relationship between law and politics. In the case of the Germans and, and the Syrian army officer, I'm actually happy from, from a personal standpoint that, that, you know, they reached their decision and they actually sentenced him. Okay, well, they found him guilty. I, I don't know if they, they, they actually issued their sentence yet. Um, but, but I do believe that universal jurisdiction could, if handled appropriately, become a more than optimal mechanism for dealing with this type of situation, especially because, you know, he was never, probably never, or at least not in the foreseeable future, he was never going to see a day of jail in, in Syria or a day of court at that. Okay, so if we're celebrating globalization so much and if we're celebrating you know, how, how we've become this global village, okay, then let there be justice in the village, no matter where it actually happens. No, you said a minute ago uh, that, uh, you know, the, that it's sometimes more about politics than it is about ethics um, <clears throat> or law for that matter. I mean, we, we see that in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to, the beginning of the United Nations again. I'm thinking back to when um, the U.S. was, um, you know, uh, providing funding and, and help and counseling to every country in war-torn Europe in 1945, 46, 47, and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, that was not just because we were good guys, but because we had won the war. And we had demonstrated power, and we still had the power, the respect, the awe, the influence, whatever you call it. And so um, we could call the shots. We did call the shots. We could do Nuremberg if we wanted, because we won the war, you know, even if it was questionable in, in some international law sense. But I'm thinking now we don't, we don't have that power. The, the Marshall Plan was a long time ago. Our, <laughs> our leadership you know, has been uh, severely, severely undermined. Um, and we, we can't call the shots anymore. This is a problem because if you're looking for, um, you know, and the United Nations was a much more ethical, moral place in those days. It was days. more principled. More principled. And so if you're looking for a better result, 
uh, a result either in the United Nations uh, or a result uh, around universal jurisdiction where any country offended, any country informed, any country with a mind to make the world a better place could do this. It requires leadership and there is no leadership, really, international leadership. We still have to fig figure that out. And, and rather, we have, we have Russia, which is not at all moral, and we have China, which is very pragmatic. <laughs> also That's one way to go about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But, you know, um, I think that's a real problem going forward. And that uh, project Expedite Justice and Transitional Justice in General um, and the United Nations in its efforts to, you know, slow, slow the rate of atrocity down um, could really use an international leader here and call it pragmatism, call it power and call it politics. But that's what we need. So. Where my last question to you, most is where, where are we going on this? Um, if you allow me a quick historic reflection, uh, yes, I mean, undoubtedly, the the United the United States played a major role in in redesigning what once was the League of Nations and then turned into the United Nations and and the creation of the so-called rules based order. You know, there there was a moral dimension to it. I, I am not sure or convinced that we need one single leader of the international community. I think, you know, after the end of the Cold War, the dynamics shifted. That is something that is not necessarily bad. Of course, we may not li like the particular brand of leadership shown by Russia with Ukraine, if you look at what's happening now, or with China, who are maybe not as morally uh, questionable as the Russians. But, you know, that may not be to our particular liking in terms of, you know, justice, peace, security. But I, I, am, a, I am a big fan and I believe firmly that when, when countries with good intentions come together, if there can be such a thing, okay, good things tend to happen. A, a small example, take uh, the Landmine Convention. That was, that was actually Amnesty's Interna Amnesty, Amnesty, sorry, International's brainchild. So they got together with the Canadian government and a handful of other European governments, and they pushed through the convention. Okay, and and uh, well, we we could discuss how uh, forceful the the follow up of that has been, but I, I do believe, and I remain convinced that you know when countries who have a, a good aim come together, positive change can be brought about. It's slow, it's tedious. Sometimes you know you need. A couple of, 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 you know, turning point moments, like, for example, the Rwanda genocide back in the 90s. But then after that, you know, a, a whole new conversation on humanitarian inter intervention came about, which has actually improved in many ways, not, not so many and so others. The way we think about, you know, the moral responsibility and even the legal responsibility of say the United Nations Security Council to intervene when there are war crimes, crimes against humanity. So I, I would like to think that we're moving in a generally good direction, but we need to keep a watchful eye. Yes, the, the United States no longer has this predominant position in shaping global discourse and, and, and global uh, politics, but it doesn't, it, that doesn't mean in and of itself that it is epiphenomenal or, or that it doesn't matter anymore. If it comes together, if it coalesces with other, you know, well-meaning countries, who knows? Maybe we'll even save or salvage something of that rules-based order and improve it. Well, we do have a, a younger generation coming up and we have you and we have Nicholas and we have Project Expedite Justice. Um, young people who have a different view of the future and the world, and maybe they will emerge into positions of power, influence. We have social media, which uh, tends to break borders down. Sometimes it does well, and sometimes it does not do well. Um, so the jury's out, so to speak, on that. <laughs> but, but, but maybe there's a sign curve here, you know, and maybe the next time you look, it will be better. The United Nations will be recreated somehow, and this uh, the the whole notion 
of um, global morality will emerge. I'm knocking wood on that, and I would like to, you know, connect the dots with you again on that, because I think that's what we're really talking about. Yeah, let, let's get chopping a few, I don't know, years time, and we'll talk about it, <laughs> or, or preferably sooner, you know, to comment on the process about it. Yes. Yeah, to connect, to watch it so carefully and see what we see. Moises Montiel, thank you so much for joining me today here on Transitional Justice. Thank you for having me, Jay. It was a pleasure. Aloha.